We're so glad that uh, you can actually be here for this screening of Two Dollars in a Dream and a thoughtful discussion with director Stanley Nelson and author Alilia Bundles about the real story and legacy of Madam C.J. Walker. And they both have a very personal connection to Madam C.J. Walker, as we're going to learn. Madam C.J. Walker was the first female self-made millionaire in America. Alilia Bundles is Madam C.J. Walker's great-great-granddaughter and biographer. She is the author of the New York Times notable book, On Her Own Ground, The Life and Times of Madam C.J. Walker, and the nonfiction source of Self Made, the inspired by limited Netflix series. The Netflix series star Emmy-nominated uh, actress Octavia Spencer. During her 30-year career as a television journalist, she was a producer at NBC News and then a producer and executive with ABC News. She is a Metria at uh, National Archives Foundation, and she also has a very close history with WGBH. She once interned at Say Brother, now known as Basic Black. Now we're going to introduce Stanley Nelson. Mr. Stanley Nelson is today's leading documentarian of the African-American experience. His films combine compelling, compelling narratives with rich historical detail to illuminate the underexplored American past. Nelson, a MacArthur Genius Fellow, also received the National Humanities uh, Medals from President Obama in 2013. Nelson and his wife, Marcia A. Smith, co-founded Firelight Media, a non Profit production company dedicated to amplifying social justice issues and fostering a new generation of diverse filmmakers committed to changing the story. And that's what we're all about here on World Channel. So, welcome to you both. Hi. Hi there. Hey, everybody. Hi. Um, all right, I want to start with when we were talking about the music family affair. So there is a familiar connection between the two of you and uh, your relatives. So Alilia, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about that? Sure. So um, Stanley should talk about his grandfather, but Stanley's grandfather, F.B. Ransom, was the attorney and general manager for the Madam C.J. Walker Manufacturing Company, which was founded by my great-great-grandmother, uh, Madam C.J. Walker. And um, I think that the title general manager is what people used to say, but I think that at this point, uh, Mr. Ransom would be the CFO, the COO, the CEO. He really was, was the person who uh, crossed the T's and dotted the I's and allowed Madam Walker to be a visionary. And then on a more sort of next generation, our families have known each other for several generations. Stanley's cousin, Judy, lived two doors down from me in Indianapolis and one of, was one of my best friends when I was growing up. And Stanley and his sister, Jill, are good friends of mine. And so Stanley, do you like Alilia? <laughs> <laughs> what kind of question is that? Yes, I love Olivia. <laughs> more, more than like Olivia. I love Olivia and I admire Olivia and you know, um, you know, everything that goes with it, you know. She's uh just a special person. You know, and we have we have uh, known each other, we grew up in different cities, so we didn't really grow up in the same place, but because the families knew each other, but both of us started on this Madam Walker journey in the 1970s when Stanley was starting to make films and when I was starting to do my research. So we have both developed a, you know, a body of work around Madam Walker. And so talk to us about Madam Walker. I actually was supposed to tell the story about how I learned about her when I was a little girl. Um, I was given an assignment to do a story on Harriet Tubman and I went home and I told my mom about it. Um, and she, my mom knew I was into fashion and hair and all this stuff. And she said, you know, I have somebody a little bit better. You know, let's look at Madam C.J. Walker. And my introduction to your, your great great grandmother was that picture, that historic picture of her in that convertible ride with the three other ladies, just looking so close classy and so wonderful. Um, so I happen to learn about her, but many people haven't learned about your great, great grandmother. Why do you think that is? Well, I think because we don't, history is not taught well <laughs> in most schools. And from the poll, it was interesting to see that people learned about it, Madam Walker through others and some through books. But I think if the, you know, we will see the film tonight and people will get an idea of her uh, overall biography. But I think if I just could give you the, you know, the 30 second bio, born in Delta, Louisiana on the same plantation where her parents had been enslaved, orphaned 
at seven, um, married at 14 to escape a cruel brother-in-law, a mother at 17, a widow at 20. Her hair began to fall out. She developed a hair care product and became a millionaire. And along the way, hired thousands of women, became a philanthropist and a political activist and used her money to try to make her community better. And so Stanley, when we hear that snapshot story of you with this, uh, with the uh, documentary that you did so long ago that people are just loving and I love it too, um, how much of what um, Alilia is saying was important for you to make sure you got into, into this documentary? Um, uh, everything, you know, I mean, I, I think it was, it, it, one of the reasons why Madam Walker is so important is not just because she became a millionaire. I mean, it's because of what she did for women, um, you know, how forward thinking she was, how many women were able to kind of get away from, you know, cleaning houses or, or cooking and could have their own, you know, beauty shop, which might have been just a room in their, ha in their house, but they could have their, you know, be self-sufficient and, and have some dignity in their lives. So I think all of those things are, are really important, you know, uh, about, about Madam C.J. Walker. Um, you know, it's, it's part of, of, of the story. I think also, you know, the thing that, that you'll see in the film, and I, I know Lydia can talk more about this, it, you know, is, um, you know, uh, a Madam's daughter, you know, and so, you know, that, that, that's something that, that, that's really important, you know, uh, to the story and, and kind of, you know, the second half of the story. And, and um, you know, it's a story unto itself. And so you did a phenomenal job back then capturing you know, all of this. And so uh, fast forward to now, um, do you ever look at it and say, hmm, you know what, there's a little something there that we should have, <laughs> that we missed? Yeah, I look at the whole thing and say, <laughs> and say you know, I mean, I, I you know, I, I wish I could do it, do it again, knowing what I, I know now. I mean, you know, it, this was my first, very first uh, film, you know, independent film, um, you know, 30, over 30 years ago. Um, you know, it took seven years to make the film, you know, that a lot of that was trying to raise the money because I had no track record. I had no experience that I could, could lay out there. And, you know, I mean, at, at that point, when I first started to make the film in, I think, 81, um, you know, we go talk to executives and they would be like, you know, Madam who, you know, I don't know, I don't know who you're talking about, you know, what are you, what are you talking about? You know, why is this story important? Why shouldn't we do Harriet Tubman? Or why shouldn't, you know, we do Sojourner Truth? Or why should, you know, um, but luckily, you know, I, I was hard headed and naive and, um, you know, I was able to make the film. Um, I should say that, you know, I, I produced it and directed it and co-wrote the narration you know, with my sister, among other people, I did the sound on all the shoots and I edited the film. So, you know, uh, part of the reasons why I was able to make the film was because I didn't have to pay anybody um, but myself and I, I came really cheaply. And so when you just say, to say, I did the sound on two interviews. <laughs> It was which, that kind of party. Tells you the amateur room. <laughs> it was that kind of party, and my, my sister is the narrator, and my mother is interviewed in the film. So, you know, it was it was uh, you know, a family affair, truly. Definitely a family affair. You know, I want to go back to what you just said when someone said to you, "Well, why not Harriet Tubman, or why not Sojourner Truth?" What's your answer? What was your answer? Um, my answer is that I'm doing a film on Madam Walker. You know, those are all great stories. I mean, you know, go ahead and do those. But, you know, we have to take them one at a time. I mean, all the stories, you know, are, 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 are worth doing. And, and Madam's, you know, definitely a story that, that, that's worth doing. You know, I mean, you see, you know, 500,000 hits on this film, you know, 30 years later. So I think that testifies to the fact that, that this is a story not only that is worth doing that, but that people want to see, you know, so. And Alilia, hair is such a serious thing in the Black community. You know, it is, a, it is no, you know, it is nothing to sneeze at whatsoever. And I remember seeing that picture of your great-great-grandmother, and that was an introduction to glamour for me. You know, it was very glamorous. Um, is that something that you, you know, kind of uh, equate when it comes to uh, people talking about the legacy of Madam Walker? Yeah, well, you know, you consider that at the time, uh, there was nobody really saying black is beautiful. 
-hmm. And Madam Walker was a woman who had been at the bottom of the caste system in America. And yet she put her own image on the tin. And at the same time, there were white owned companies and they were putting images that were more of European women on their products and in their advertisements. And Madam Walker kind of drew a line in the sand and said that black women can be beautiful. And then at the same time that she was selling these hair care products, this wonderful hair grower to address some really scalp infections at, at a time when most people didn't have indoor plumbing, she also was creating financial opportunities for women. So as much as she was healing their scalps, mm -hmm. she was also giving them self-confidence and healing their you know, souls in a way to help them become economically independent at a time when, as Stanley was saying, most Black women who worked were domestics or were farm workers. And she's saying, no, you can have your own business. You can educate your children. You can invest in real estate. You can buy a home. And she was creating um, many opportunities for women. Even with, I mean, her education was so limited and for her to kind of have the foresight to say, you know what, I don't have to stay in this position and neither do you. Well, and the, the limited education, I think is, you know, it allows me to drill down on something. And that was her real talent for surrounding herself with excellent people. So her, the woman who became the manager of her factory Alice Kelly was a former dean of girls at a black boarding school, and she in many ways was her private tutor. She was a self-taught woman. Her bookkeeper had the highest score for the civil service exam in Indiana, but couldn't get a job in the war department because she was black. Mm -hmm. Madam Walker's hiring of F.B. Ransom, a young attorney who had gone to Columbia, who really had all of these skills that allowed her to have a general counsel, but who was much, much more. And those people, she surrounded herself with what we now call the C-suite, but they were very conscious of creating her legacy. So now we have more than 40,000 documents of her personal letters, her photographs, her business records that Mr. Ransom and the secretaries oversaw. And that allows us to tell the story in great detail. I want to... I want to also go back to something that, that, that you said just a bit earlier about, you know, <clears throat> hair being so serious. Um, one of the things that, that we thought when making the film that, you know, maybe people took hair just a little bit too seriously. So, you know, there's some, there's some funny moments in the film, you know, where we kind of joke about hair. And one of the interesting things was when we were out there screening the film, you know, 30 years ago, um, I noticed that when we screened the film to a largely white audience, they didn't know what to make of it, you know, because they, they did not want to laugh about black women's hair, you know, but when we showed it to black people, they would crack up. So, you know, I started saying, you know, before the film, you know, it's okay to laugh. Some of the film is, is actually, you know, funny and, 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 you know, try to give them a little freedom to, to laugh, but they were very, they took it very seriously. They didn't want to laugh about black women's hair. <laughs> Understood. Understood. So many people who are watching have seen Self Made. That's the Netflix four part series on the life and legacy of Madam C.J. Walker. Um, it's based on a true story inspired by the life of Madam C.J. Walker. Uh, and it's not necessarily a documentary. It is not a documentary. Um, I'm going to ask you, Alilia, you know, I know you you did an article for The Undefeated where you pretty much didn't hold your tongue. Uh, but I'm going to ask you, because you were a uh, you were a consulting producer on the film. So when you look at the final product, um, how did you feel about the final product? And we did we just, put, we just put a poll up and ask people if they watched, by the way. So I'm really glad that we have both Two Dollars and a Dream and self-made and the books that I've written, the four books that I've written and all kinds of uh, museum exhibits. So there are many ways to learn about Madam Walker. And of course, when you reach a Hollywood audience, it's millions of people that you would not ordinarily reach. I thought Octavia Spencer was perfectly cast as Madam Walker. Every time she came on screen, I could see this, the pages of my book coming alive. And so that part I really loved. And I, I loved the hair, talking about hair. I thought the wigs were great because, you know, we sometimes can see movies about Black folks and the wigs are really, really bad. Yes. And, and I love the fact that there's a, the idea of prosperous Black people during the early 20th century, because I think a lot of people, Black and white, 
and other don't know anything about that, don't know that there were prosperous Black people, educated Black people. So, you know, there were things that the idea that more people know Madam Walker's name is a good thing. Uh, there were things I would have done differently. Uh, I would not have done the Addie Monroe character who really was kind of a stand-in for Annie Malone, who was a really different kind of person, who was a successful entrepreneur and philanthropist and who didn't really have a colorism issue. So I, I would not have um, emphasized that. Um, one of the things, uh, Esther was not a real character. Uh, Alelia Walker's real life conflict with, with her mother was over two men, both doctors, both handsome, both of whom she married. So I would have done that a little differently. And in terms of F.B. Ransom, Stanley's grandfather, I would have made him a much stronger character. He was so integral to the day-to-day -day operations of the business and was really a straight arrow. And Stanley's mother, um, I told us the story that as a young man, he had taken a, an oath to never drink, smoke, or gamble. And so during the scripting process, because I did have script review, I, I really objected to that because he would never have bet on the number. Sweetness was a made up character that the showrunners and the script writer wanted. But I, that was something that, that kind of bothered me that he would be made to appear to be somebody who would do something illegal and that a black business would um, need to invest in, need to get money that was illegal because that didn't happen. No, Stanley, I know you don't like to talk about other people's work, but as it relates to your grandfather, um, do you share the same sentiment as Alilia? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, 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 I kind of wanted to see more, more of my grandfather in it, but you know, I mean, I, you know, that's that's because it's my grandfather. My grandfather passed away before I was born, you know, so I, I never met my grandfather. Um, you know, I heard a lot about him, so I mean, you know, that's just a selfish thing. I would have loved to see seen more more uh, of him in, in there. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that that I remember. Uh, Alilia saying to me, you know, as they were making the film, you know, that that that, that generation of, of black folks, you know, coming out of enslavement, you know, um, the kind of people, the strivers, they were very straight, you know, they believed that if you walk the straight and narrow and you strive and you pushed that, you know, good things will come to you. And, and, and that's who they were. I mean, they were not, you know, there, there was another set of, uh, of black folks, you know, that might have gone to the juke joints and gambled and, and stuff like that. But, but, you know, FB and so many of the people that were associated with the company um, were very, very, very straight. Right. Stanley, I wanted to talk uh, with you about uh, the article that you wrote um, in the Chicago, what is it, the Tribune, just about um, who needs to tell the story and uh, the importance of uh, black filmmakers uh, and the importance of them telling the story, you know, in this time of COVID-19 and of George Floyd, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. Talk to us about uh, the challenges of being uh, that black filmmaker who wants to tell that story. Let's start with that. Well, I mean, I, th I think it's important that, 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 you know, people tell their own story. And, and that's what we believe, you know, at my company, you know, Firelight. And, and um, you know, we work with filmmakers of color to help them you know, get their films done, made, and on the air. And we, we believe that people need to tell their own stories. We believe that people can tell their own stories in a much deeper, a much new, more nuanced, a much better way than someone who kind of parachutes in. I think there's no clearer and better example in, in, in many ways of, of what white privilege is uh, than white filmmakers, you know, constantly telling stories about the other, about, you know, black folks or, or Latino folks or, or, or other people, you know, uh, and, and we don't, we don't tell their story, you know, we, we tell, we try to tell our story, but you have, you know, white filmmakers who, who the people who control the money uh, you know, are, are much more comfortable with, you know, they're just more comfortable with a white filmmaker coming in and saying, you know, hey, Bob, you know, I, you know, I, I want to do the Madam Walker story, you know, um, I did a film, The Murder of Emmett Till about Emmett Till. And, and I remember, you know, we premiered at Sundance and I was in a food line with another filmmaker, a, a white filmmaker who come, his parents are, are exceedingly rich. I mean, billionaires, you know, and, and his, 
he, he makes films. And, you know, we were on the food line. He said, oh, you made Emmett Till. You know, that's a story I always wanted to make. And I was like, Jesus Christ, you know. Um, and why? You know, I, you know, I mean, that why, why do they constantly make f films, you know, uh, uh, about us? I mean, you know, but, but again, you know, you have the, the advantage, the privilege of, of walking in uh, to some, someone's office who controls the money, who 99% of the time looks like you, um, you know, and, and, you know, my wife, Marsh and I, who I work with, we have a, a, a joke, you know, where, where somebody, you know, black, you know, comes on screen and we, you know, there's just something about them that I like. I, I don't know what it is, but I trust them, you know, and that's, that's, that's what, what, you know, uh, white filmmakers get. So, you know, I, I think it's just important that, that we tell our own stories. We can dive deep. You know, I, my, every, every um, you know, every reference I have in my life is based on African American culture. You know, you know, we're talking about my grandfather here. You know what I mean? My great grandfathers on both sides were enslaved people. You know, um, and so you know that that's 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 what I come from. That's the history I come from. You know, you can't dive into and and make a film. You know, about the black community or any community, you know, outside of your own and, and really, I think, get in as deeply as, as you can. And, and again, you know, I think it, what I said in the article is one of the things that, that white filmmakers can do and white executives can do is, is help, you know, filmmakers of color make those stories. You know, that, that's the best, that, that, that's something, you know, everybody's wringing their hands about George Floyd, you know, and, and how things have changed and Black Lives Matter. <clears throat> but finally, you know, what's gonna happen is that, um, you know, white, white folks, you know, all across the board, including white filmmakers and white executives are gonna have to give something up if they want things to really change. And let me just mention, uh, The Murder of Emmett Till is running on World Channel October 3rd. Uh, it looks like at 8 p.m. So we are gonna be uh, wearing that. So. Uh, there is that. Um, you also, uh, I had also um, uh, talked to you before about raising money for these films. Um, and is there, some, is there a, a specific kind of strategy uh, that you would advise Black filmmakers to implore when they are trying to raise money to create a film, to make a film? And yeah. Olivia, you can chime in on this too. Don't don't curse anybody out as much as as much as you might want to. You know, you never know when you might have to go back. It never that never does you any good. I, you know, I mean, raising raising money is hard. You know, um, you know, it 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 does get easier when you, you know if you have uh, you know you know films under your belt. But you know, it took me seven years to make two dollars in a dream, and that was with me doing you know all those things that <laughs> that I listed before. You know. Um, it just is, it's not, you know, film, filmmaking is, is expensive, especially historical filmmaking, you know, um, it, it can be, it can be expensive. So I think, you know, it, it's just a, a matter of, you know, uh, crossing the I's and dotting the T's and, and understanding that it, it's, it's expensive. And, you know, you're, you're asking people to take a risk on you and, and, and you know, to, to help you make this film. And, and so you, you've got to kind of, you know, be very calm about it and, and, and strategize. I mean, we, we wrote tons of proposals for Madam CJ Walker. We had, we had all these great pictures in the proposal. So you could see, you know, that, that, that we, that we had visuals for it. It's still, it is not easy. And you, I mean, it essentially sounds like for every film you're having to make a case and more, the more films you have, behind you that makes your case a little bit stronger and pushes the winds, uh, hopefully in your direction? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, um, I, I look, I, I've, I've been very, very lucky, you know, to be able to, to you know, make films and, and, and you know, and, and kind of, you know, get, get uh, 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 a reputation behind me. But, you know, I think, you know, the film we're, we're gonna watch tonight, 2008, this is my first film, you know? And so, you know, I, I, look, I think one of the things was that, you know, I was able to do all these things, right? I was able to do the sound when Lily wasn't doing it. I was, <laughs> you know, I was able to edit the film, you know, I, you know, I, you know, I was able to, to help with the writing of the film, you know, I mean, I, so, you know, I had, I had these kind of, 
you know, other skills that, that, that help me, you know, make the film. I think that's really important. You know, so that if you're out there trying to make make films, you know, the more you can learn filmmaking, the more you can understand, you know, filming, the more you can do yourself, you know, uh, the better, you know. And Alilia, did you want to talk a little bit more about the power of being able to tell your own story? Sure. So, um, where, you know, I admire Stanley for his ability to just have uh, been able to stay the course and to stay true and authentic to the vision that he and Marsha have had for so many decades. And you can see, you know, all of the things that he has done since doing Two Dollars and a Dream. I in ended up working in network television news, so I had a different path in getting here and then writing books. But for me, it's the, I guess the equivalent of, um, as Stanley says, don't, you know, don't scream at people, is that I still in some ways felt I had to speak my truth about what I would like to see in terms of collaboration between historians and directors and studios, that I think there is um, some room for real partnership, especially with telling these stories about African Americans whose stories have not really made it to the big screen, that there's this first pass at it. It's one thing if you're, you know, George Washington or Marilyn Monroe and there are 52 films about you, you can take a little bit more creative license. But that first pass, I think it's helpful if we uh, don't distort people too, too much that we sort of stick to the core of the person. And so uh, while I, I learned a lot from the self-made experience, I'm really glad that the story is out there, but I'm really hoping that I get another pass. I'm trying to, with this, I'm writing a new book about Alelia Walker. There's a lot that I've learned in the last 10 years. There's a, certainly a lot more than Stanley knew when he was making Two Dollars in a Dream. So we have a, a more dimensions for Alelia Walker's story. And I'm really eager to tell that story about her being a patron of the arts and traveling internationally and all the people that she knew and really being able to take that story to the next level. And I think I know that story now well enough that I can help others tell it. And so I know in your Huffington Post article, you said that there's the Hollywood truth and then there's, you know, the journalism researched factual information. And so you're hoping to essentially try to merge those two in some way. When yeah, it comes to yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's, you know, there's just a way that I think these characters, these African-American characters whose stories have really been erased and marginalized are so much more interesting than some of the cliches that, you know, sort of the formulas that are Hollywood. We are very, very interesting just as we are. And obviously you've got to have composite characters and conflate time. But I think that we, you know, let us shine through with these real stories and put a little bit of a Hollywood spin on them. Excellent. All right, we actually have some questions. I did promise people we were gonna get to questions. Uh, Francis Smith asks, what is, uh, what is it that makes a historical documentary particularly expensive? Stanley, I will let you answer that or we'll start with that. Um, it, it's the footage, you know, you know the, the still pictures, you know, if you want to use, uh, you know, uh, uh, historical music, you know, you gotta pay for it, you know. Um, those things are, are there and they're, they're fixed costs, you know? So, you know, you know every film clip that, that you see in 2000 and Dream, every picture, you know, um, you know, you have to pay for. And so it, it's just a, a, a very expensive endeavor, you know? It, and so if, if you're doing a contemporary story, you know, you're doing a story about, I don't know, you know, the garbage workers in, in New Orleans, you know, and, and you're following somebody, you can go out and shoot it. And, you know, you could, you could shoot it on your iPhone or whatever and edit it yourself and, you know, all of that. And it, and it could be uh, not as expensive, but when you're making a historical film, you have to pay, you know, for all the archival material. And, and that can be a very expensive uh, endeavor. So, you know, we're working on a film now, we're, we're finishing up a film on the on the crack era of of the 1980s, uh, and you know the archival is like three hundred thousand dollars, and that's just the uh, that's just that's just the oh uh, and the music is another eighty thousand, so that's three hundred eighty thousand dollars right there, you know. 
you know, before we've paid anybody or, or you know shot anything. So that that's just the costs. But but I should say that the film has a lot of archival and it has a lot of great music. All right, this message is for uh, Alilia. How old were you when you realized your family's history and how important was it to you at the time? I know we talked about this before, uh, before we started uh, the session uh, today, but that is a question um, from someone. So they would like to know. So my mother was vice president of the Madam C.J. Walker Manufacturing Company when I was a little girl. So I knew that's where she worked. Um, she did not make a big deal about it, which is, I think very wise of her so that I wasn't overwhelmed. The silverware that we used every day had Madam Walker's monogram on it. And I sometimes, you know, played with her uh, mother of pearl opera glasses and the baby grand piano on which I learned to be read music had belonged to Alilia Walker. So I knew something about them, but it was really not until I was in college that I sort of eased up on the story. And then when I was finally at Columbia in journalism, working on my master's that Bill Garland, the one black woman on the faculty recognized my name, Alelia, realized I had a connection to Madam Walker and Alelia Walker and insisted that I write my master's paper. So that was really how I began to do the deep dive. Wow. All right, um, let me do uh, one other question and then we will get to the film and we're not going away after the film. So if people have a few other questions, we will um, take them. All right, would you like to see a stage version or a theatrical film version of Madam C.J. Walker? That is for both of you. And uh, I guess the person is asking, oh, Deborah Ray Sims asked if Stanley would direct, write and produce it. Is that possible? <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I would love, I would love to see, you know, you know, more and more interpretations of, uh, of Madam C.J. Walker, more interpretations of the time. You know, I mean, it's such a, it, it, the story has so many different uh, nuances. It's just a, it's just an incredible story. You know, I mean, you know, when we were trying to pitch the film and get, you know, we we're like, oh, there's a film about black women. There's a film about black business. There's a film about hair. There's a, film, you know, we had, you know, had a million. You know, um, so there's so there, there's so many different things that, you know, um, you know, pieces of the story that, that that are exciting. And Stanley did another pass at it with Boss, uh, the Black Experience in Business. There's a, there's a segment about Madam Walker, but a film that he made um, a year and a half ago. So that really talks about entrepreneurship. But with Alelia Walker and Madam Walker, you could do a whole thing on music. They're, the fact that they lived in St. Louis when Ragtime was being born, they lived across the alley from Tom Turpin's Rosebud Cafe and then take it all the way through the Harlem Renaissance and all of the musicians and writers and actors that they knew. Just, you know, their social life is a, you know, is a film and certainly a musical and a theatrical release. So there's, there are a lot of platforms that I think we can work with. Can I can I just tell a quick story just going into the film that that I, I've never had a chance to do before before we watch the film. So when we were we were re researching the film. Um, we found this musicologist who who made a, a bunch of records about um, you know like like about uh, women you know and, and from from the twenties and like you know wild women never get the blues. He had an album called that and a whole bunch. Of, of, of other things. Her name was Rosetta Wrights, and she had a thing called Rosetta Records. And, uh, you know, uh, I went to see her. She was in New York. I went to see her, talked to her. She said, you know, there's this song called Nappy Headed Blues. I, I saw it cited somewhere, and I, but I've never heard it. But you should try to get it, you know, because Nappy Headed Blues. So we, we looked all over. We were looking for that, for that record everywhere we could possibly look. Uh, and finally, we, we got to a music, this is before the internet, we got to this musicologist in Vancouver, and he said, a oh, nappy the blues? Oh, yeah, I got that. Send me $5, and I'll send you a tape of it. And so he sent us the tape, and me and the associate producer put it on, and, you know, it's My Hair is Can't, well, it's a song that starts the film, you know, and, and, uh, and the last verse says, um, Went to Madam Walker, sent her a $20 bill, went to Madam Walker, sent her a $20 bill, said, help a young girl, if you will. And we just fell out. We had never heard it. We had no idea that, that, that the song mentioned Madam Walker. 
and it was one of the craziest moments I've had in filmmaking because we just looked at each other and were like, is that real? And that's how the film starts. So that's the song that starts the film. Alilia, looking at, um, you know, the documentary, what do you think is, um, well, I would, I'm not going to, I'm going to ask you, um, a fair representation of your great-great-grandmother. Is it this or self-made? You know, I'm so glad to watch this. Um, I, Stanley, I watched it when World Channel first put it up uh, in March. And watching it again, it, Stanley, it holds up so beautifully. And to be able to see those elders who you were able to capture, we just, they're gone now. We would not yeah. have their story. And it, I mean, it just really, really holds up. And, you know, Tina, both um, Self Made and Two Dollars in a Dream have their own way of telling the story. I love this because my grandfather's in it and the, oh, the elders who were in the building when I was growing up are, are in this story. And we have all of the beautiful nonfiction, factual information. And so I think it just really stands on its own. Self Made because Octavia Spencer is in the lead role really has elevated Madam Walker and people know about her all over the world. I love the fact that you know, this was a big hit in Brazil and that I was getting messages in Portuguese. And I hope that all of the people who watch Self Made will watch this so that they can get another dimension. And I hope they will read my book so that they will have some factual information. And so what I was getting as we were watching it, it's, it's so far beyond hair, right? We're looking at how, uh, you know, the legacy of Madam C.J. Walker essentially changed the quality of life for Black folks um, then. And, you know, just giving people opportunities, giving them careers, an opportunity to make money, an opportunity to look glamorous, an opportunity to enjoy the theater, you know, all of these things. Um, how much of that do you take personally in terms of your work um, when you think about, you know, empowering other women and empowering, you know, Black people in general, is it something that you take personally as, you know, part of your legacy? So, you know, you're, if you're asking me, absolutely. I mean, I feel like I get up every day and I get the opportunity and the privilege of telling Madam Walker's story and Alilia Walker's story and that the fact that it does inspire people. I had yesterday, there was a young woman on Instagram who had tattooed Madam Walker's a portrait on her arm. Beautiful, beautiful tattoo. She's a, a hairdresser. She's inspired by her. But I know Stanley does the same thing with the topics that he picks for his film. It is about empowering Black people and telling our stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Stanley, did you want to add? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things I learned, again, this was my first, first film, and, and it took me seven years to make, is that you know, if you're going to commit to telling a story, it better be something that's really important, at least to, you know, you a, a, as the filmmaker. Um, so, you know, I try to make films that, you know, at least are, are important to me because going into it, I still don't know how long it might take, you know, to, to actually get a project done. So I, I learned a lot from, from making this film. And um, as promised, I wanted to get to a few questions. Um, so this is from CJ Murphy. Um, and I think that you've answered this, Alilia, with all of the years of research you've done. But I said, did the family history get lost because of the early death of Madam CJ and her daughter? So I was actually just typing that in. No, we, I mean, we know the story. The, we fortunately have thousands, tens of thousands of pages of documents. And all of the people who Stanley interviewed, my grandfather had saved things. I have my own personal Madam Walker family archon. So we have a great deal of material and every generation, um, you know, passes it on to the next. I've donated items to the Museum of, uh, National Af Museum of African American History and Culture and consulted on museum exhibits and other places. So the story is preserved. We are really happy about that. And um, are Madam C.J. Walker products still available? Yes, you can, the products are available. They're manufactured by Sundial Brands. So we are very happy. They're not the original formula because a hundred years worth of research and development means that there are a lot of things that we know about hair that were, you know, in hair care products that are different now. But the Madam Walker label, MCJW, is still around, I'm very happy to say. 
Excellent. Okay, this message is for this uh, question is for Stanley from Rick Perez. Hi, Rick. Uh, Rick says, how has independent documentary filmmaking changed since you made $2 in a Dream? And has it changed or not changed for filmmakers of color? Um, you know, I, I think obviously everything has changed a lot. You know, I, I, we made this film, there were a couple of questions that came in. Uh, we made this film, we shot on 16 millimeter film and we edited on 16 millimeter film. Um, so there, you know, that, that's changed. Uh, you know, the, when we made the film, the only um, outlet for, for these kind of documentaries was PBS. Now there's, you know, Netflix, Hulu, HBO, ESPN, you know, there's, there's just so many more uh, out, outlets for the film. And, and so, you know, I'll, I'll, there's a lot more, a lot more documentaries are, are getting made. I think, you know, it's still hard for, for filmmakers of color to get films made. And that's just, you know, the, the, the true story of it. And so, um, although much has changed, you know, much has stayed the same. And it's still very hard for filmmakers of color to get stuff done. And what do you want people, this is for both of you, to take away from, uh, from the documentary, from the film we just watched? I mean, for me, there, there, there's, there's, you know, the film is about so many things. It's about, you know, black business and, and, and success and, and success, you know, against the odds and, and, and you know, what, what hard work can still get, get you. Um, but it's also about, you know, that, that there's more to success than money. Um, you know, there was so much more to Madam C.J. Walker than, than just the, the money. Um, you know, it's about black, black beauty and, 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 and African American women's beauty and, and, and you know, there's, 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 so there's so many different ways to, to take the film and so, so many different things that you can gain from the film. Yeah, I, mean, I think Stanley really um, captures it. It is more, it's more than just about the fact that she became a millionaire, though that fascinates people. But for me, it's the legacy that she left in empowering other women and as a philanthropist and a political activist to supported the anti-lynching movement. When she had her first convention in 1917, uh, her message to the women was that your first duty is to humanity. And the women sent a telegram to President Woodrow Wilson urging him to support legislation to make lynching a federal crime. And you see, we're still trying to get that 100 years later. She was a woman ahead of her time. And uh, Francis says, would uh, Alilia, would you consider a uh, Madam C.J. Walker philanthropy prize? You know, there actually are some um, prizes. There are luncheons that the National uh, Coalition of 100 Black Women do every year. Um, there are other things that Madam Walker Legacy Center in Indianapolis is doing. And actually there's some, I'm actually talking with somebody right now about some scholarships um, that would be awarded in Madam Walker's name. So stay tuned. <laughs> and that brings me to the next question. What is next? Um, I know you talked about the scholarship, but what's next for you, Alilia? For me, I am almost finished with the first major biography of Alilia Walker, and it will be out next summer uh, from Scribner. So that's the, the main thing that I'm working on. Excellent. And Stanley, what's next? Uh, you know, as I mentioned, we have this film on, on the whole crack era that's coming out on, on Netflix in the fall. We're working on a film on Attica. Um, you know, a major film on Attica. Um, we have a, a massive project on the Atlantic slave trade, looking at a four-part series for our PBS, looking at the uh, slave trade as this massive, massive uh, international business um, in, in uh, selling human bodies and, and how it shaped the world that we live in. It's called Creating the New World, and it's, um, you know, I'm working on that too. And parting words of advice for filmmakers, you know, uh, journalists, storytellers, um, what would you tell them about this particular moment uh, in history? Because we're in historic times here. So for people who are looking to tell this story, what do you advise them to do? For, for me, I, I mean, I think, you know, two things. I, I, I say learn the equipment, you know, because as you saw in that film, you know, my name was on it as editor and so many other things. So I think that's really important. And I think, you know, the, the main thing is, is to learn your craft, you know, um, to, you know, we all have stories to tell, we want to get a message across, but, you know, it, it's about, you know, how do you tell that story? You know, you can tell stories in a million different ways, you know, so how do you, how do you tell stories and how do you, how do you get better at, at what you do and how do you constantly work at it? 
you know, you don't have to be making a film, you know, every moment of the day to, to watch films, to see, you know, what, what you like in a film, to, you know, see how a film is put together. How do you start a film, you know? How do you end a film? All those things, you know, are things that, 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 that you can figure out. You know, the thing I always say to people, look, it's not rocket science, you know? It's not brain surgery. You know what I mean? If, if you wake up on the operating table and you see me with a scalpel, you're in trouble. So, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not, that it's something different and you can learn how to do it you know we all we all know what we like you know make try to make films that, that, that you like and Alelia um for me because I'm not I mean I, I worked in television news for 30 years so I tell, tell stories visually in that way but now I write books and I write articles and as Stanley said just you know learn your craft um, read a lot, write a lot, um, look for the facts, do deep research, and, and be credible. I think that if you um, know what you're doing and you really care about it, you will be able to tell a story that will draw people in. Thank you to Stanley Nelson. Thank you to Alilia Bundles and audience members for joining us tonight. Please remember to watch the film. If you have not, if you came in, you know, mid uh, stream today, um, you can go to World Channel's YouTube page um, and take a look at uh, the movie, the documentary about Madam C.J. Walker. So we really do appreciate you and we hope that you have a wonderful night.